one of the talks I gave at the AGI 13 conference here in Beijing was in a special session called Probability Theory or Not. The session was intended to address the question of whether probabilistic reasoning is suitable as a key component of AGI systems. And I'm on the probability theory side. I don't think you can pragmatically derive a whole AGI design from probability theory, but I do think probability theory is an important mathematical and conceptual tool to use in the design of, of AGI systems. In the OpenCog AGI system that I've been working on with a bunch of people for a number of years, one of the key components is PLN, probabilistic logic networks, and many of the other components integrally use probabilistic methods. In this particular talk that I gave at the AGI 13 conference, I showed a little bit of mathematics that I did. In essence, in the middle of the last century, a guy named Cox proved a theorem that any way of reasoning about uncertainty that satisfies certain simple consistency criteria must be probabilistic reasoning. So, in a sense, if you're reasoning consistently about uncertain knowledge, you're reasoning probabilistically. Now, there's a weakness in the applicability of that theory to the real world because no real world system can be totally consistent. We just don't have the compute resources to be totally consistent. So what I proved is that if you reason about uncertainty in a way that's roughly consistent, probably approximately consistent using the math lingo, then you roughly must be using probability theory. You must be doing reasoning that's probably approximately probabilistic. So the, the message was that probably approximately consistent plausibility implies probably approximate probability. So, and I think that that's not particularly surprising. It's an intuitive consequence that if, if full consistency requires probability theory, rough consistency implies roughly following probability theory. That this was just a rigorous proof of that assertion, which provides some justification for what we were already doing in OpenCog, which is building a system that is, on the whole, roughly consistent, and which roughly follows probability theory by integrating probabilistic methods with other methods as well. Over the last 20 years, probabilistic methods have drastically grown in importance within the AI community, partly on account of the massive rise of available data. And it's just become apparent that probabilistic methods are really good for dealing with big data, whether it comes from visual sensors or from documents on the internet or, or whatnot. But of course, within the academic world, people will look at things from every possible perspective. And there's a load of different logic systems apart from just probabilistic methods. And each of them has its own advocates within the academic community. And in various ways, each of them probably has something to teach us. So I, th I think it's not bad that there are researchers covering a wide variety of reasoning methods and exploring their applicability. But in the end, I think probability theory is an important part of the mix. Part of the motivation for the workshop on probability theory or not was Pei Wang's research on a non-probabilistic logic that he calls NARS. And NARS ultimately, in, in my view, probably is not going to lead to an AGI. I've been debating this with Pei Wang since 1998, and 
I don't think either of us is going to convince the other based on argumentation. We may convince one another based on empirical results after a sufficient um, amount of, of time has passed. If, if I get a probability-based AGI to be as smart as a person, or he gets a NARS-based AGI to be as smart as a person, ultimately we're both empirical scientists, and one or the other of us would then convince the, the other one. But based on, on theory, we each have our own different theories, and we argue back and forth, and we learn something from, from the discussion, even if we don't convince each other. The PLN inference system we use in OpenCog does use quite a lot of ideas that are inspired by the NARS system, even though we use a, a probabilistic framework that is not in accordance with Pei's ideas. One insight that Pei Wang had is to use term logic rather than predicate logic, which is a different formulation of, of logic rules. Another insight he had is that to measure truth, you don't just want one number. You want one number that somehow gauges the strength of an inference, and another number that somehow gauges the confidence associated with that inference. So we're doing term logic with truth values that embody both strength and confidence, but we're doing that in a way grounded in probability theory rather than grounded in his, his non-axiomatic logic. So here in Beijing at the AGI 13 conference, I actually gave five talks, which I think is a, is a record for me. The first one was giving some mathematical theory on the use of probability in AI systems and, and why probability theory makes sense even in a system with finite resources that can't be totally consistent. You still want to use probability theory to be as consistent as you can and make the best possible use of your own resources. One of the talks was on improvements to OpenCog's MOSES system, which enabled it to better deal with a huge variety of diverse inputs in its learning of, of procedures. The next talk was on improvements to the Destin computer vision system that we're using in OpenCog, explaining how to connect the Destin computer vision system better with OpenCog's probabilistic reasoning. The next two talks were a bit more general and, and speculative, going over future directions that I think the AGI community might benefit from thinking about. One of them was on a, a language called Lojban, which is a speakable version of logic. So if we talk to the computer using Lojban, instead of using regular languages like English or Chinese, then the computer would have much less trouble understanding what we're saying. Lojban is much less ambiguous than normal human languages, and it, it might be that this sort of speakable yet logical language is suitable to serve as an intermediary between humans and early stage AGIs. And the final talk was about the intelligence of different subsystems of the body. My own approach to AGI is not so much centered on emulating the human brain anyhow. With OpenCog, I'm trying to create a different kind of mind, which is more stable, more rational, more, more goal-oriented than the human mind, and also better adapted to existing computer systems. On the other hand, I think it's also a fascinating project to try to emulate the human mind as closely as possible, especially because I would one day like to have a version of myself uploaded from this meat body into some sort of computational or robotic body. From that standpoint, I think it's important to consider that the cortex and the brain as a whole are not the only thing that, that gives us our humanity and our intelligence. The brain is connected to the endocrine system. The endocrine system is connected to the millions of neurons in, in, in your gut and, and to your, your, your liver and the, the, the liver's various biological pathways connecting to the brain and the, the immune system, which via the HPA axis and other mechanisms regulates neurotransmitters, ties in with your, with your stress response and the endocrine system. All these subsystems of the body connect together 
and give us our emotional response, our ability to, to pay attention, to orient and feel the world and know who we are. And ultimately, if you want to simulate human-like intelligence, unfortunately, the cortex isn't enough, the brain isn't enough. The body has its own intelligence, and this seems a point particularly pertinent here in China, in Beijing, where we just had AGI 13, because the ancient Chinese certainly understood the overall holistic intelligence of, of the entire body in some ways that Western medicine and science haven't caught up with. That's a challenge for those who are trying to build AGI in a way that emulates human intelligence and it also, perhaps, is inspirational for those of us working with robots. It indicates a direction that would be interesting, making robots that have more complex body systems, reacting to the world holistically in, in richer and, and more integral ways, even if you're not aiming to make an AGI that directly emulates humanity. If you're trying to make any AGI that fundamentally engages with the physical world, using a body with complex sensors and actuators, you might benefit from coupling the core cognitive system with a bunch of, of simpler adaptive learning systems that help regulate the interactions of parts of the body with the external world. OpenCog is an integrative system for a number of different reasons. There's there's a practical reason, which is that there are lots of interesting, reasonably capable AI subsystems out there, each of which solves some piece of the problem. And by combining those pieces together in a way that allows them to interact synergetically and build on each other's strengths and work against each other's weaknesses, then you may be able to build something fantastic more quickly than if you ignored all this existing work and just built something completely from scratch. On the other hand, beyond the purely pragmatic aspect, there may be some conceptual, philosophical reason why an integrative system makes sense. This has to do with the, the hierarchical nature of, of the world that humans operate in. So many of the patterns we see in the world around us have some sort of hierarchical structure where you have simpler patterns or subsystems building up into slightly more complex ones, building up into slightly more complex ones, and, and so forth. You have patterns in patterns in patterns in patterns in patterns. The deep learning approach to AI, which has gotten a lot of press lately, takes this insight that the world consists largely of hierarchical compositions of patterns, and it manifests this in a very simple way, in terms of quite specialized spatio-temporal hierarchies of pattern recognition elements. But the insight that the world consists largely of hierarchical compositions of patterns is much broader than the simplistic spatio-temporal deep learning architecture is being explored and it's it's much broader than simple hierarchical neural nets or deep Boltzmann machines or HTNs. And from this broader perspective, an integrative AGI architecture is actually just another manifestation of this hierarchical aspect to the world. At one level you have a whole AGI system like OpenCog at the level immediately below in the hierarchy, you have the different components that are being integrated into OpenCog. At the level below that in the hierarchy, you have the parts of those components. And above the OpenCog system in the hierarchy, you have the community of human and digital minds that are all interacting with each other in, in a shared environment. So actually, I think the integrative approach is quite natural in the light of the hierarchical compositional nature of the portion of the world we live in. And you can see it in the human body. I mean, the human brain, you know, we, we've got the two halves, we, we've got the cortex, we've got the basal ganglia, 
we've got the, the cerebellum. The brain itself has a hierarchical modular structure, as does the body. It's not an undifferentiated mesh of, of ooze somehow. There's, there's a liver, there's a heart, there's lungs, there are discrete parts doing separate things. But these discrete parts are not completely separate and modular parts, as, as in many devices that we would build now mechanically or electronically. Rather, these parts all these parts all interact with each other and regulate each other through the complex system of of hormones and, and other chemical biological messengers going through the body. All the different parts of the body, all the different parts of the brain have to interact richly with one another and I think the same is true with the parts in an AGI system. Yes, you can build an AGI system by integrating, say, a logic engine, a, a procedure learning system, a hierarchical vision processing system, a nonlinear attention allocation mechanism, and so forth. But the different parts cannot operate independently any more than the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the, the cortex, and the cerebellum operate independently, any more than the brain, the, the endocrine system, and the immune system operate independently. The parts of a real-world complex self-organizing system all have to interact with each other and regulate each other and help each other to do their jobs better, which is, is what makes the building of an integrative AGI system difficult and a complicated and, and subtle matter. If you could just take separate components solving separate pieces of the problem and hook them together and then you have a mind, it would have been done already. But in fact, what we found in building OpenCog is even when we can use someone else's ideas or someone else's open source software as part of the picture, you always have to go in and make a lot of changes in those ideas and those software to get to get the whole thing to to work and that's a lot of what we're doing now in OpenCog but I think we've charted out a fairly clear path for for how to do it and I finally finished writing my 800 something page tome on all the particulars of how to wire together all the parts of the integrative mind inside OpenCog which should be appearing in print probably by the end of this year. Of course, it's sufficiently complicated. Even an eight or nine hundred page book is just sort of the summary abstract of how to put all the pieces together. This is, this is a big job. If you think about it, IBM, they built Watson, which is basically a large expert system, 25 PhDs and a huge amount of support staff and hardware over four plus years. What we're doing with OpenCog is much larger than that in the number of parts, the complexity of how they work together, and the intended behavior of the overall system. So it's big. On the other hand, history shows that sometimes the right small group of people can do something much faster and, and much better than a large, expensive group of people within a large corporation. For, for example, IBM had a large staff building the first PC then Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak came along in their garage and, and built something that was competitive and in, in many ways better, the first Apple PC. So examples like that inspire me to think that even though Watson took dozens of people and all these supercomputers in a number of years, and what we're trying to do is 10 to 100 times bigger, even so, by following the right idea, and having enough focus, passion, and motivation among the right group of people, we may be able to get something as amazing as an open cog based human mind working with, with a lot less resources. But time will tell.